Um, firstly, just a couple of things. Number one, thanks very much to all the and the community. I know Bridge isn't here, but I was talking to Michelle, and there's a lot of, a lot of work that's been, you know, um, been put in by Bridge and, um, and the ICA here as well. So can I just thank everybody? And it's great coming into a community because this, uh, you know, this series was, we were talking about how we deliver it. And I love coming into communities right across the county uh, to bring it as opposed to having it in a large centre and have a large lecture, you know, and, uh, and that's, I suppose, that's the important thing about getting involved and going into communities. Um, so I just want to thank everybody. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be in the native parish of the home place of um, one of Le Leitrim's great historians, and he's sitting here tonight. And I know I've asked a very proud of Michael Whelan. Um, Michael was a great help to me um, when I was doing my PhD and when four course were publishing the book as well. And actually speaking of the book, I have to say this, I hate saying it, but I have to say it because the publishers always say, the book, I have the book here if anybody wants a copy of it, I sign it or whatever, and it's a, it's a lecture price. It's, I think the price is 25 or 30, I don't know what it is normally, but it's 20 quid for, um, and I'll sign it. So if you have a wedding present, if you need a wedding, wedding present, as I call it, divorce present, 21st or anything like that, <laughs> Um, it's here for your Christmas present or whatever if you want. I, I'll, um, um, I'll sign it for you later on. So that's that out of the way, thank God. I hate, I hate that part of it, but uh, that's it. But when the book was being edited, we were putting in the acknowledgements and all that type of stuff, and there was two or three copy editors in Four Course Press, and when it was published to my um, shop, I was going through, and there was a number of people left out of the acknowledgements. And one of them was Michael Whelan, um, which to me was blasphemy and, and all that. And I rang, I rang Michael. Michael said, oh, "Will you go away with that?" As he says, "There's no, there's no need for that." But and I said, "How, how in God's name?" And I was talking to the, the editor, and I said, "How, I said, how could that be missed?" And do you know why it was missed? There's, there's another historian, he's a British-based historian called Michael Wheatley. Um, they looked at the M and the W and whatever and sound here and the top was the same song out of it. So that was it. So um, but I I I, I want to public publicly acknowledge um, uh, Michael Whelan's contribution to the book and uh, Michael has been of great assistance and everybody knows he's one of Eatram's great historians. So um, so th thanks Michael. Thank you. Okay, I'll kick off. Um, I hope I won't keep you. It's actually, it's a cold night outside and it's actually lovely in here. So um, thanks to everybody for um, making uh, this location very, very hospit hospitable. Um, on the 30th of December 1921, the South Cora Dáil Cantor of Sinn Féin met and instructed its councillors to vote for acceptance of the treaty. At a specially convened meeting, Following that Cora Dáil Cantor meeting, Leitrim County Council ratified the treaty and instructed the four members of the newly constituted Leitrim North Roscommon electoral area and the four members, James Dolan, Thomas Carter, Andrew Lavin and Count Plunkett and Sinn Féin and the County Council instructed them to vote for the treaty, to vote in favour of acceptance of the treaty. Around the area, it was peaceable. In Carrick, for example, local curate Father Dalton advised that in the interest of peace, no public political meeting should be held and that people should be free to make up their own minds on how to vote in the upcoming election on the treaty. In Leitrim, unlike other counties, major conflict between both sides of the treaty was avoided um, and preparations started for that election. There was only one meeting in the county and that was in Carrick and Shannon in March. But early in 1922, Leitrim witnessed the withdrawal of Crown forces across the county. The Roscommon Herald reported that, and I quote, the IRA are vigil vigil vigilantly engaged in the protection of the people and to their credit, 
It may be said that everything is well conducted and law and order is maintained. Michael Collins and his pro-treaty colleagues from early 1922 established a, a, a government, a provisional government, but in all this chaos, while the pro-treaty side were winning the political debate and most of the people were for the treaty, influential IRA leaders across the county uh, and, and country were anti. And in Leitrim we find, um, we'll see in a minute, there was two sides of Leitrim, one pro-treaty and one anti-treaty. So what we find in many ways that with this peaceful transfer of power across Leitrim, a lot of the old barracks that were occupied previously by the, R the RIC and the Black and Tans, they were handed over to local IRA units. That's exactly what happened. In Leitrim here in, in, in 1922, the, the Royal Sussex Regiment, they were, they were the, the regiment in, in the uh, county. They started to move out. And by the 14th of March, the 14th of March is the day they, they left Carrick, but before they left Carrick, they dumped surplus arms that they couldn't take and ammunition and explosives and they threw them into the River Shannon just to make sure that the IRA didn't get hold of them. That was it. So local newspapers welcomed the, the departure of the RIC and they said, and I quote, it says, it's a big change in 12 months when the paid bullies would not allow, who, who would not allow the people to walk the streets without insulting and abusing them. They were reflecting what was happening across um, the county 12 months previous when the Black and Pans and Auxiliaries and RIC were operating around. Now, funny thing about it is, the position of the IRA's South Leitrim Brigade was pro-treaty. It was pro-treaty because of the influence of the blacksmith of Bannon Lee from just up the road, Sean McKeown. Sean McKeown, a close colleague of Michael Collins's, the Flying Column, the North Longford Flying Column and the South Leitrim Brigade cooperated a hell of a lot during the War of Independence. And because of McKeown's position, South Leitrim went pro-treaty and all the IRA units in South Leitrim went pro-treaty. It was different down in the north of the county. In the north of the county, IRA units were part of the third Western IRA division and they were anti-treaty. They went anti-treaty they were under the leadership of, of uh, Brian McNeil, who we, we talk about in a minute, or a few minutes, Seamus Devins and Billy Pilkington. Um, and one of the things, I suppose, that one of the first actions of the provisional government in many ways was, was to try to, min to uh, maintain some sort of law and order. They put a Republican police in place. Um, uh, they tried to actually go along and set up a civic guard. There was an, a, a bit of a mutiny. It didn't operate. So in that vacuum, local IRA units took up policing duties. That's essentially what happened. Now, in that environment, it, there, was, there was guns in that environment, obviously. And with guns, <coughs> there was lawlessness. And there was a lot of people going around um, who were probably claiming to be connected to both sides, the anti-treaty and pro-treaty side of the IRA, and they were basically, they were, it was their own private enterprise, a lot of them were robbing banks. Now, ro robberies were a daily occurrence. Um, post office robberies around this area um, uh, were common. Now, that, uh, I'll give you an example. Between the 23rd of March, 1922, and the 19th of April, less than a month, there was 319 post office raids reported across Ireland, 319 of them in a month. Um, at Garva, 26-year-old Hugh Canning was killed in an altercation with neighbours. Uh, in Mohol, uh, publican and local merchant Paddy McKenna was shot and seriously wounded. He didn't die in, a, in an incident linked to a property transaction. Uh, but again, it was, you know, it, law and disorder were rife in the county at the time. Down in Drumshambo, raiders went in and stole £200, which was a lot of money at the time, from the Northern Bank in the town. And within three days, they came back and robbed the bank again. So you can see straight away what was happening. In the same week, Carrick Railway Station was robbed by armed and masked men, and a large amount of money was stolen there, and goods were taken from the railway stores. 
So that's what we find. Now the other thing that happened as well was obviously with the treaty, Ireland was divided north and south. A new state, the northern state, and obviously what was, became to be known at the time as the Irish Free State. But one thing that we find that up north at the time, between the 6th of December and the 31st of May, 81 Protestants and 169 Catholics were killed in violence, in sectarian violence. So it was a very violent society at that time. What we find as well, Michael Collins was trying to go along and he was trying to negotiate in some respects the treaty, renegotiate the treaty, and Britain obviously didn't want that. Um, but what he was also trying to do was, he was also trying to reunify both factions of the IRA. And the only thing that they actually had in common was the Northern State. So what he did was, he went along and set up what we would call a Northern Command. And that Northern Command was specifically geared towards trying to destabilise Northern Ireland. So there was cross-border raids um, with the intent of destabilising the North. So Collins played what I would call a careful balancing act between he, he was claiming that he, this outraged politician on one hand, but he actually was covertly uh, encouraging both sets of the IRA to go along basically and create mayhem. He set up uh, this, nor this um, what was called the Northern Command, and the Northern Command was, was uh, under the leadership of, um, it was under the leadership of Frank Aiken and Owen O'Duffy. Um, one of the first things they did um, in response to the threatened execution of Republican prisoners in Derry Jail, um, they actually organised um, a ki kidnaps of prominent Unionists across the border. They organised from a, a base in Black Lion, we know where Black Lion is on the border there, the cabin leaving from Anna Border, and they deployed IRA units from Longford and from Leitrim um, and from Armagh and Mayo. And the idea was to go into the north, kidnap prominent unionists. Now, the raids proved successful going into Tyrone, but when they were going into Fermanagh, unfortunately, they met with uh, quite a lot of resistance. The A Specials, this, the, the RIC, the, we normally associate with, with, or the RUC with B specials, there was A specials and B specials, but there was a speedy deployment of the B specials uh, in around Enniskillen, um, um, and they went along and captured the uh, the the IRA raid party that came from Leitrim. They captured them. Five Leitrim Republicans were actually uh, part of that party. One of them, Bernie Sweeney. Some of you might. Be aware of Bernie. Bernie had a shop in Ballinamore. Bernie Sweeney, John Kiernan, Joe Reynolds, John Griffin, and Charlie Reynolds. They were part of that 14 man raiding party. They claimed the whole idea, they didn't recognise the court, and they were actually claiming that it was a political act, not a criminal act. Um, but before sentencing uh, the group to 10 years in jail, um, Judge Wilson said basically that a crime was a crime whether it was committed by a politician, a saint, or a butter merchant. And he sentenced them to 10 years in jail. Now, two further significant acts took place in around the Leitrim border at that time, the Leitrim from Anna border, um, in this campaign. One, one of them was led by Charlie McGoohan. Now, Charlie McGoohan was from Ahu, outside Banlamore. We, we'll hear a little bit more about him in a few minutes. Um, he was a leading member of the South Leitrim Brigade, the IRA. He was reputed, that, like he shot in, back in April, the, the previous April, he shot dead black and tan uh, constable in, in Banlamore, and he was also reputed to be the, 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 the man who killed uh, Lieutenant Wilson in Chimor. So he was a very, very, um, he was a very, very active IRA man in the South Leitrim Brigade. But he took Collins aside as well in the Civil War, and he led an attack on the barracks in Bell Coo um, in Fermanagh, just across, as we, as we know, from Black Lion. They overpowered the occupants, they seized a large quantity of arms and ammunition. And then, a couple of days later, um, again along the same stretch of border be between Leitrim and Fermanagh, 
On the 5th of April, a six-man RUC patrol was ambushed on the border at Garrison. The machine gun attack, it, it happened at 9.30 at night. It resulted in the death of a constable, Ed, Edwin Plum, and the wounding of two of his com comrades. The other three in the patrol got back in, into Garrison. They got um, reinforcements, they came out, they recovered the two injured colleagues. They couldn't find uh, Plum at all, but the following day, Plum's body was found on the Leitrim side of the border. It was in a badly mutilated state and was taken back to garrison by a local clergyman. So that's what we find really. We, we find a border campaign at the time, and that's it. The other thing we find is land agitation. And the thing about it is, at the time, everybody was looking for a bit of land. And there was people going into occupying land. But the, the Free State authorities at the time, in this part of Leitrim, they were, they, 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 they were led by Harry McClellan, again a former uh, Leitrim IRAman. And basically what McClellan was, uh, um, he was adamant that people wouldn't go in on other people's land. He said that really at the end of the day, it had to go through the courts. And in Drummond, there was an example of um, uh, an occupation and a group of local men were charged with a land seizure and they were, they were warned to stop that activity. And the court heard on a quote, it says, the, the defendants took the law into their own hands and the judge said no civilised government would, could tolerate such an act, which was sheer Bolshevism. And you'll find at the time as well, the government, Sinn Féin did not they feared that basically the fight over land would, would split their party. Um, so they wanted to make sure basically, they wanted to prevent land seizures, they wanted to enforce law and order, and they did it here in Leitrim quite a bit. The Minister for Agriculture, Patrick Hogan, he recognised that the, the, the solution to it was basically through land purchase, like what happened um, when Britain um, was here um, just again go, go back to the 1880s. But Hogan himself basically he was a substantial farmer down around Leash and he described these land agitators as being, and I quote, he says, from the worst elements of the country districts with a pretty liberal sprinkling of wasters from the towns. So he had no high opinion. Of he said they're practically all landless, the great majority have no genuine claim to land and wouldn't make a success of farming. So he said that there were all a bunch of wasters in the towns, and that was it, end of story, trying to go along and occupy land. Um, so that's what we find. So Harry McCone, basically, his policy was, and he put it in the place, was if he ever found anybody around this part of the county, uh, the, the south part of the county, occupying land, what he did was he seized the cattle on the land, shipped the cattle out to Drummond and Narragate, off to Dublin, and sold them. And that was it, and the state kept the money. So that actually stopped an awful lot of land occupation. So that's what we find really. We also find uh, at the time as well, Jimmy Gralton over, you've heard of Jimmy Gralton. Jimmy Gralton was very active around Gowell, and um, Jimmy Gralton and his supporters basically, you know, were very anti, obviously, Harry McKeown, um, and, in the, and government troops, again, under the command of of, of, of McKeown tried to thwart Gralton at every move. Um, they occupied Gralton's hall, you know Jimmy's hall that the film was on, that hall was occupied, the, the Pierce Connolly hall, but there was a big standoff between locals and troops at the time. Um, threats were made by the troops to burn the hall. They said that they, they'd burn it. Um, then they occupied the hall, the locals stepped away, they occupied the hall. But while in occupation of the hall, um, Free State Army Officer James McLaughlin was killed in an accidental shooting in May. He actually approached the hall and he failed to respond to the sentry's challenge. His home comrades challenged him, didn't know who, who he was. He was approaching on a motorbike and he was shot dead. Um, so that's what we find basically. We, we, I suppose we, we find really. Um, Land agitation happening, a lot of lawlessness. We find quite a bit of that, uh, you know, and that's that's essentially that's what we're finding at at that particular time, you know, in in the county here. 
But meanwhile, what was happening was we find that attempts to go along and try to bring the, the, the two parts of the IRA together, the anti-treaty and pro-treaty. Collins was still trying to work on that, but at the end of the day, he was unsuccessful. Here, in many respects, like when examples would be to try to bring the North Scotland Brigade, they who initially declared Martin Fallon that he was anti-treaty, then he changes to the pro-treaty side. Um, as a result of that, then the IRA, they further divided. So there was a lot of discord and discontent at the time. But in, in many ways, the South Leitrim Brigade's support for the treaty contributed quite a bit to the fact that this part of the county was relatively peaceful compared to what was happening right across the country. You know, you certainly had lawlessness, you had some land agitation, but overall, you had peace, that's what you had. You didn't have mass killing. But despite the best attempts of Collins, the war started, the Civil War started on the 28th of, uh, of June. Uh, a lot of pressure from the British, especially after the killing of Henry Wilson. Um, so basically, it was a case of, at that time, uh, Republicans had occupied the four courts under Rory O'Connor. The word was out, get rid of them, get them out and control your own country. The British went along, supplied the guns, the war started, that's what we find. So really, I suppose at the, at the end of the day, when the war started, the Leitrim Advertiser, again there was a paper that was published in Mohol at the time, reported that, and I quote, a feeling of despair and sadness has come over the population at seeing the country now enmeshed in the throes of civil war with Irishmen fighting against other brave Irishmen. The Roscommon Herald was also equally despondent when they said, and they declared, and I quote, all the blood, misery, suffering and ruin endured in England for the last, endured in Ireland for the last six years goes for nothing when just as much or even better might have been had for the ask under Red Redmond's old worthless parliamentary party, referring to basically saying that look what they have now, you know, Redmond could have got it. But he's, they said that it is this reflection that makes the civil war now raging in Dublin so maddening and heart depressing. Um, now, unlike the War of Independence, there was no formal Republican unit within Leitrim itself during the Civil War. And that forced an awful lot of anti-treaty IRA men to actually join anti-treaty units in North Roscommon and Sligo. And really what we find is that, as I said to you earlier, while all three Western divisions of the IRA were anti-treaty, the South Leitrim Brigade supported the treaty. And the likes of Jim Gallagher recall, he says that the new that the few Leitrim anti-treaty from South Leitrim, uh, they went to Boyle Barracks to join their North Roscommon comrades because in Leitrim, he says, the whole brigade became pro-treaty. So we find a very, very much pro-treaty South Leitrim brigade. So an awful lot of people then start talking about the, the class issues and stuff like that. But what we find really is that like, there was no the rich supported the treaty, the poor didn't and all this type of stuff. Really at the end of the day we find that it was the same type of character that was more than likely pro-treaty than anti-treaty. Now obviously, you, you know, the money classes, the business classes, the press, the church were very, very pro-treaty. They wanted the economy to kick in and, you know, society to develop. It's not the fact that the, the anti-treaty side didn't. But generally, the wealthy tended to be pro-treaty. And that was it. But, you, you know, we find really, I suppose, in, in many respects that, you know, the same type of character was probably fighting on the pro-treaty side as was on the anti-treaty side. That's what we find um, from a class point of view. Um, we find that with strong Republican resistance across large parts of the west of Ireland, the National Army were intent on taking control of, of this region. Um, and they set about it, and 
Within 24 hours of the bombardment of the four course, there was a, a, again an advance into North Leitrim by um, Free State units based in Finner Camp in Donegal. Now, in that advance um, by pro treaty Free State force, forces, we find two Republicans, anti treaty Republicans, were killed. One was James Connolly. James Connolly was a Sinn Féin member of Leitrim County Council. His father was killed in controversial circumstances in Kinloch in an army raid on, on, on the house in September 1920. Um, he was killed. Another Connolly, no relation, John Connolly. John Connolly was only 18 years of age. He was the second Leitrim anti-treaty um, uh, volunteer to die in the open weeks of that civil war. His family received a note informing them that his body was in a coffin in Tullahan Church uh, for collection, that his death was the result of an accidental shooting in a, an IRA training camp. His father at his inquest told the inquest that his son was an apprentice shoemaker in Gondorn, where he had left the employment to fight with the anti-treaty forces and then he died in a training camp. So that's what we find in many ways. Um, we also see um, that when, when we look at what was happening at the time, we find that if we look at the, the two opposing factions of the National Army, um, we find that the two of them were around, one was based in Sligo, North Leitrim, and the other was based in Arigna. And what we find is, we find that um, it was interesting really that if the, the Arigna column was under the command of um, Ned Bofin, Edward Bofin, um, and Bofin again was an interesting character, um, and the other column was based in North Leitrim under the command of Billy or Liam Pilkington and Brian McNeil. Um, now, the National Army Intelligence reports identify Bo Finn as, they say, a leader known for his soldierly quality, qualities. And what Bo Finn used to do is said, it compelled, they, he, he compelled his men to go to bed at eight o'clock every night, to make sure they got up at two o'clock in the morning to conduct operations under the cover darkness. So it was very interesting, Harry. The other unit obviously were based um, at the at Rahilly House, and they, that was in the Gore Road Estate in, 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 in Sligo. Now, the two units obviously were fighting against provisional government stroke free state forces. Uh, people are often, are often wonder like, was it provisional government or free state or whatever, and an awful lot of historians use both terms. Now, the provisional government technically was the government that was set up right at the treaty or just when when the English left and it was in place for 12 months for 12 months after the treaty was signed and then technically the free state was established in 12 months after that that would have been in December 1922 but a lot of people use provisional government and free state interchangeably um, but that's the I suppose definition of it technically it was a provisional government because the free state did not come into, in, into being until um, December 1922. But I suppose, back to what was happening, I suppose, on the ground, what we find is, we find that in the summer of 1922, the war starts and there was a massive advance, a massive advance, really, of the, the um, Free State National Army forces. Uh, against the towns that were occupied by pro treaty IRA. So that's what we find, the likes of, like Carrick was pro treaty, so Carrick wasn't a problem, but Boyle, there was a big battle in Boyle, and when that battle in Boyle was, um, was finished, the pro treaty side were better armed, better equipped, they actually bet the anti-treaty side, the anti-treaty side left Boil and headed for Arigna, headed for the hills in Arigna. And that was Bofin's group. And they would provide massive resistance 
to the Free State, free state Provisional Government Forces for the duration of that civil war. There's no doubt about that. Um, and there's a, I suppose there's a, a long lecture on, on their activities, <laughs> but we, we won't go there tonight. Um, if we look at it, Pilkington's group again was equally strong um, and they actually attacked the town of Manor Hamilton on, on the 9th of July. Uh, they were occupied in a lot of incidents. Now, Manor Hamilton was a good example. In the attack on Manor Hamilton, the local priest came out and he intervened. He actually, his name was Father Brady, he intervened, he stood in front of the National Army garrison in the town. He informed the attackers, and he quote, he says, he'd remain there, and if they attacked the barracks, he'd be the first to fall. So obviously, they didn't want to kill the priest. So what they did was, they acceded to the priest's request, and they withdrew. But two weeks later, they were back again at the barracks, and the priest wasn't around, and they raked the, 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 the barracks with machine gun fire. So they were also involved in quite a lot of road trenching and attacks on trains and mails as well. So in July 1922, a lot of bridges across the county, especially across the, the north of the county, uh, were destroyed. Um, and some were so really that William Cosgrove, who was um, president or prime minister, technically prime minister at the time, he asked influential public figures, most notably the clergy, to go out and clear roads and help the army to clear roads. And that's what happened across the county. For example, a local curate in Killary, the family of McManus, he came out to organise local people to clear obstructions that were put in place by Republican anti treaty forces just outside Manor Hampton. Pro treaty TD James Dolan, he had a very, very narrow escape from Republicans. He had a climb over the wall, he jumped over the wall and he escaped. Um, and he was waiting for the train at Glen Farn railway station um, to get to Dublin. And there was an attack when he was there um, by Pilkington's forces on the barracks and he just literally hopped the wall and got out of there fast. He would have been a target for them as well. Um, on the 5th of July, Pilkington's column captured the uh, National Army outpost out at Kinlaw and basically the 15th man garrison were disarmed and all, they took all their arms and ammunition as well. So that's what we find. But I suppose in some ways really, we, you know, we find that, um, that advances by pro-treaty forces um, were successful, there's no doubt about it. But like, the, the pattern up in this area, or in the northwest, because this area is emphasised, it was relatively peaceful. But what happened was, the army tended to go along, control large towns, and they controlled Boyle and they controlled Sligo. The same thing happened right across the country. But what we find is that they had superior manpower in the whole lot. But what we do find though is that they were meeting fierce resistance in Sligo and North Leitrim. No doubt about it. Um, the Arigna column was actively engaged in fighting. Um, they attacked Drumshambo barracks in, uh, in September 1922. They overpowered the garrison. They captured rifles, uh, ammunition, and explosives. They also killed uh, uh, an army private, James Dolan. And before they left, they actually went along and they set fire to the barracks. That type of thing made government forces very angry. They went, they got into the mountains after them. They were constantly going into the mountains, but they were never, ever successful in capturing the original column. Um, during one search in the mountains on the 14th of August 1920, uh, 1922, a 14-bed Republican field hospital was found, uh, staffed by four nurses. You can imagine that. A 14-bed field hospital, staffed by four nurses. Somebody said to me once, geez, it was a far better health service up there then than it is now. And, you know, but in many ways, when you go along and look at that, you can actually just see how organised, how organised they were. Now, in an attempt to take control of the region, at this stage, we find that there was low morale uh, among an awful lot of National Army troops. And not an awful lot of the National Army, 
uh, and Free State Army troops were they were they were young, they were young men. Um, morale wasn't great. Um, McKeown's command area in this area it, it it reached from believe it or not it was one of the biggest areas to try to control and it reached his command area reached from Athlone all the way to Donegal so you can imagine that um, that area at that particular time uh, so it was logistical logistically probably impossible to go along and, and recapture that area in that area, he had two of the strongest anti-treaty columns. He had the original column, and he had the column down in North Leith from North Slide against him. Um, and as I say, morale was so bad that at Drummond here in, in September 1922, government troops, they actually surrendered their barracks. They surrendered a Lewis submachine gun, 20 rifles, ammunition and explosives to Republicans as a protest against lack of pay and supplies. So like that type of stuff was just unbelievable to see when you look at it. Um, at that stage we find that McKeown, um, the old patient was, was wearing tin because what the Republicans also did in July of that year, they went along and there was an armoured car that the uh, National Army Free State Forces were using against Republicans. That armoured car was called the Bannel, the Bannel, the Bannel Lee, I get it out yet. All right, named after obviously the town where Sean McKeown came from, the blessed with the Bannel Lee. And what happened? That armoured car was operating around North Leitrim and Sligo to try to take control of the area. What happened? That armoured car was actually captured by anti treaty forces. They captured the armoured car and they used it against pro treaty forces, their own armoured car. So that created huge embarrassment, massive, massive embarrassment um, for, um, for, for government forces. They were angry um, and basically. We were, we were, they were basically saying, we're going to take over this area. We're going to take control, finally, of our area. And that's what they tried to do in September 1922. In a coordinated military operation, troops from Manor Hamilton, from Boyle and Sligo under the command of McKeown, and troops from Finner Camp under the command of Joe Sweeney, they actually went along and advanced on that north lead from North Sligo area. Um, and what they did basically is, Jordan Sweeney's advance from Finner, they took control of, of Kinlaw and Tullahan, they recaptured Kinlaw and Tullahan from Republicans. 30 Republicans, anti treaty Republicans, surrendered at Kittyclaher. On the outskirts of Manor Hamilton, 14 Republicans were arrested in possession of arms and explosives. Um, in their attempt to thwart this move, um, Republicans derailed trains in the region. At Drumahair, they apologised to the train crew, informing them that they were compelled to take such, a, such action, they said, because their comrades had been surrounded by numbers of Free State troops, and it was their duty as Republicans to take every possible step to checkmate the movement of Free State soldiers. But because of this advance, Pilkington and his men had to get out of their headquarters at Rahali House on the Gore Boot Estate. <coughs> and en route to a meeting with Pilkington at Glen Carr, Brian McNeil, Seamus Devins, Paddy Carroll and James Banks, they were shot dead by government forces on the slopes of Ben Bowden. The nature of the killings proved controversial, with claims that the four were taken away from the main body of National Army troops and executed by machine gun. While official sources claimed that the men were retreating from an ambush site, Captain Charlie McGoohan, as I say from the Moor, he was accused of directing the killings after the men had surrendered. On the same day, two other anti-treaty uh, comrades of the four that were killed previously, Harry Benson and Tom Langan, they were also intercepted by the same group led by McGovern. The bodies of both men were found 11 days later at the bottom of a ravine.
Benson's body contained bullet wounds to the head and shins, while Langdon's body had seven bullet wounds and a vein wound. Uh, as McNeil's body was taken to Dublin for a private family funeral, the remaining funerals in Sligo attracted large, large crowds. Now, Brian McNeil is an interesting character, and when we look at that particular killing, the six that were killed, you, you may be familiar with, they're referred now um, in history around Sligo and North Eastern as the Noble Six. Um, they were killed in controversial circumstances. Brian McNeil, Brian McNeil is probably the best example of brother versus brother in the Civil War. Brian McNeil's father was Owen McNeil. Owen McNeil was, again, he founded the Irish Volunteers back in 1913. He was Minister for Education in that provisional government. Two of his sons were actually National Army, Free State Army officers. And his other son was fighting on the other side. When Brian McNeil's body was brought back to Dublin for a family funeral, his two brothers carried the coffin. They killed, and it, it was ironic really that they were carrying the coffin of their brother, and the brother was shot dead in controversial circumstances by their comrades. You know, it's interesting, I, I was, um, the connection with, I suppose, today is, you're familiar probably with Michael McDowell, are you? you know Michael McDowell? Mm -hmm. Michael McDowell, Brian McNeil is Michael McDowell's uncle. And I spoke with, with McDowell um, at, at a seminar in Carrick and we went for a drink after like some of the insights. If any of you were interested in this, it's probably up on YouTube. There's a, uh, uh, Michael McDowell actually made a very good documentary on, on that, uh, you know, and, and the whole brother versus brother. But it was, it was, um, it was sad, uh, very, very sad just to see what happened there. And uh, not just for that family, for, for every other family that were affected, you know, and that was it. Very controversial killing, you know, and again, there was a statement came across it in the National Archives, unsigned, but again, by one of the uh, soldiers who was there on Ben Bogle, one of the National Army Free State soldiers, basically said that, look, they were identified, they were coming. Charlie McGoohan was alleged to have gone out and waved a cap. It was a morning mist. They saw a man with a civilian cap. They actually said, right, it's one of the, our own guys. They went towards them, then they were surrounded. They were identified and they were um, basically ordered to be shot. Funny enough, actually, most of the troops that night refused to shoot them, or that morning refused to shoot them. But a small number did, they were ex uh, servicemen and uh, from the British Army. They went along and they got a Lewis machine gun and uh, them. So, like in, in many ways, like we talk about, like, like Kerry, Kerry has Valley Sea. This area has been both, you know, atrocities. And I keep saying, when you look at that atrocity, like no side had had a monopoly. Like that was an atrocity, you know, you, where people were, were captured and they were shot dead. That was it. But Republicans did the very same as well. It wasn't just National Army. You had both sides do very, very bad things, like both sides do. So no side, I always say this, had a monopoly on atrocities. There was atrocities carried out by both sides. Former comrades killed former comrades. That was it. Sad war, civil war. Every war is bad, civil war sometimes are had a bit more bitter, as we know. Now, by the end of September 1922, we find that this area and the area, this area and obviously North Leach was generally speaking what we could say in the control of after Ben Bulb and after that day, um, you know, North Leach and North Sligo again was in, in control of provisional government forces. People say that there were roving bands. The Freeman's Journal report said there was an attack again in Bell Coup again. And it said roving bands of irregulars who have recently been seen in the Glen Farn and Kilkenclamma districts of County Leitrim. So what we find is we find that there was, I suppose, in many ways, there was certainly there was 
a guerrilla warfare, and that was basically it. That's all that was being carried out then. Very, very irregular stuff. But, but a couple of things happened. One interesting thing um, was we find that uh, a pr Father John Casey, Father John Casey was wounded. He was a curate in Drumshambo. And he was wounded on the 25th of October 1922 in a shooting incident outside the town. And that brought again renewed attention on the region. Casey was coming back from a funeral in Valley Shannon on his motorbike. Very unusual at the time, a priest on the motorbike, but again, he, he, he was coming through. And at Galley Bridge, just out, out, outside from Shambo, he was basically shot. Um, uh, he was shot in wounded, he wasn't shot dead. There was common heard described the priest's Sinn Féin sympathies during the War of Independence, reporting that his service, not alone to Lee Trump, but for the entire cause, has been unequalled, and there was scarcely a man, clerical or lay, to whom such attention was paid by the British government during the reign of terror. So he, basically they were saying he was a target for the British. But he was also a target that night. It was believed that the cure had failed to stop when instructed to do so by, and again it was the original column, um, and as a result, shots were fired. Uh, but despite receiving that bullet wound, he stayed on the bike, he got to his, the, the parochial house in Drumshambo. He was treated by a local doctor, afterwards to transport to, to, to Dublin, where he successfully recovered. Um, now, the Casey shooting, basically, at the end of the day, that again, a lot of renewed attention on the area around there. Lo and behold, large forces of troops arrived into Warrington, into Drumshambo, armoured cars, they searched the mountains, didn't get anybody. Now, it was hard enough at the best of times to run up into a ring but going up in the middle of October, you know, wasn't um, the smartest thing to do. Um, despite the presence of a National Army garrison in Drumshambo, the Arigna column carried out raids on the town constantly and the whole area. At Manor Hamilton on the 17th of uh, November, a Republican unit arrived into the town with the intention of commandeering goods from shops and raiding the local post office. Unknown to Republican soldiers were already patrolling the town and an exchange of fire took place which resulted in the shooting of Republican leader Philip Gilgold. While the raiding party succeeded in commandeering clothes and foodstuffs, the badly injured Gilgold was transported to Dublin and he died there the following day in Vincent's house. Now it was interesting really last weekend with Mar Hamilton and it was just we, uh, the question and answer session afterwards. I got an insight into what happened that day. In fact, Philip Kilgun that day, he went in to hold up the post office. And in the post office, there was actually uh, a provisional government free state army officer. Kilgun turned around and pulled the pistol, he shot at him. The army officer shot at Kilgun. Kilgun went out into the street, he collapsed in the street. The army officer actually thought that the guns, the comrades were going to come in, and he ran upstairs into a room and hid under a bed. That's what he did with the gun cocked. Um, but it, it turned out his own um, comrades came in. The two of them were actually brought to Dublin together. One survived, one died. That was it. So it, it was interesting in many ways. Um, so that's what we find. We find that. Again, guerrilla warfare into towns, back out again. That's really, that's what was happening more than anything else. Um, a police presence, at that stage the Civic Guard was um, established. But the Civic Guard was basically, again, the idea was that you would have, Sligo Leitrim was a, a division, one, uh, one office in Carrick, main district, and the other in Sligo. But despite that, it still didn't stop this county from being lawless. There was raids on um, uh, Carrick railway station again. Whiskey, tobacco, boots, size of eight, and were stolen there. Um, and again, we find that while there was a certain decrease in areas where there was a police presence, out around the country areas, the place was being robbed left, right and centre. At Balnameen on the 17th of October, two men assaulted the barman at McGowan's public house 
They removed the till from the premises. They placed the till outside on a donkey and cart. They emptied the till, made their way, made their escape by bicycle towards the border. That was it. So that's the type we're talking. In Newtown Gore, the premises of Robert Gorby on the 11th of October was raided by armed and masked men. A ton of flour, bacon, sugar, boots, whiskey were taken to a waiting horse-drawn wagon. The raiders then robbed cash and clothes from Johnson's drapery store nearby. So they were suited and booted, they robbed the town and they went home with a lot of clothes as well. And that was it. So that's what we find. Um, uh, on the 17th of November, the first attack on a civic guard barracks in the county happened, and that took place at Banamore. Members of the Arigna column arrived, and they arrived by train from Drumshambo. They took over the train, brought it into Banamore, they placed roadblocks around the town. The intervention of the local curate again prevented the burning of the barracks, but the raiders, the compromise was they took police uniforms and equipment and then they went around and proceeded to take goods from local shops. And they went back up to the railway station, put all the goods back on the train and headed back out of town, headed for a ring. And that was it. Um, and we also find that, again, out here in Carrigallon, just up the road, there was an attack on the Civic Guard Barracks at the end of December 1922. A 20-strong party, and again, it was the, the, the arena column, they forced their way into the barracks, and while the policemen were treated very courteously, um, the press would have said, by the raiders, the barrack consignment of uniforms, raincoats, blankets and leggings were all confiscated, and that was it. So there was ongoing raids all the time um, across the county. That's what we find. Um, we find that also an agrarian dispute caused the death of, again, Francis McCarran. And again, when you have guns in a society, grudges can be sorted out, personal grudges can be sorted out, and land agitation and all that. And that's exactly what happened to Francis McCarran. 57 year old farmer from Shambos shot dead. Ten days later, three raiders shot dead Thomas and Carson Dennison. And Thomas and Carson Dennison had a family shot and they were shot dead during the raid on the premises. The Dennisons were a local Church of Ireland family who had traded in the town for decades. They were very sympathetic to Republicans during the War of Independence. 29-year-old Thomas died almost immediately in the attack. His 74-year-old father, widowed father, died three days later in hospital. There was no witnesses to the killing. Nobody was ever arrested. But again, the Arigna column were suspected of kill the killings of both men. So that's what we find. And we find, as 1922 ended, we find continued lawlessness. We find... Um, the army in control of broad parts of the county, but we still find a guerrilla unit very, very active in the county. So what we find that, I suppose, to conclude, in lead from the transfer of power was conducted in an orderly fashion. The majority of people and their public representatives accepted the treaty. The absence of candidates, I suppose, from organised labour and farmers ensured that there was no real contest in the 1922 election. You had a peaceful political environment. There was land agitation, but Leitrim didn't witness the same major unrest that was associated with other regions. We find continuity, we find change, but we also find atrocities taking place like what we had in in, uh, in uh, or at Ben Bullivan. So what we find is, we find a relatively, relatively peaceful county, a lot of lawlessness, land agitation, but generally speaking, we actually do find, compared to other areas, um, not the same amount of killings, but we still had our own atrocities. I suppose when we get into 1923 next year, that will be more interesting because we had the likes of, you know, Dr. Muldoon killed inside the mall. We had uh, a number of other controversial killings at the time uh, involving um, the Arigna Column, 
where two of the Arigna Khan were killed up in the Arigna Mountains, uh, Cull and Timon. We also had a massive attack really that caused massive um, unrest, consternation in the whole of Valley Panel. Not in this county, but not too far down the road there, by the Arigna Column, where um, they came in and shot up the town uh, and uh, killed um, a, number of, a number of inhabitants in the town. So um, there'll be a lot more fun next year when we start discussing this stuff as well. So can I just thank you so much mm -hmm. for your time and for the questions you want to thank you. Mm -hmm. He's, he's a professor in, uh, in Tralee, in County Kerry, and he's a native of Moe. And uh, he, he has done a lot of research on this, and he has books here to say, uh, uh, you know. You don't have to buy any of the books, that's. He's not my agent, by the way. But if you want, to say, if you want a book, they're there. Uh, but that's all. Michael, thanks so much for that. It means so much to come up <laughs> Was that just was one side the, the anti traders Was that to cause mayhem? Was it revenue generating exercise? No, it was an, that's an interesting question. Was it one side? It probably there was a lot of known operators, I'd say, as well. Um, especially in this area, especially when we went to 1923 in this area. 1923 in this area, we find um, that there was sort of a renegade gang operating here. And that renegade gang were actually responsible for the killing of. Dr. Muldoon and Mull, Thomas Muldoon. Um, but certainly I'd say there was a lot of lone rangers that were probably claiming to be anti-treaty, but they weren't, they mightn't necessarily be anti-treaty. Um, that's what we find. Um, that I, I suppose it's like maybe, I always say, so we were discussing this, I don't know what, where it was, but we were talking about maybe, like every political group has camp followers. And you saw the very same thing just in the recent troubles in the North. You had, you know, on, on the Republican side and the Loyalist side, you had people involved in drugs and protection and all this type of stuff. And you had, it, the, does that, that element tends, like you have people, whether, no matter what your ideology is, whatever you agree with or disagree with, you have people who have strong beliefs. Republicans, Loyalists, whatever. But you also have camp followers and you also have what I would call opportunists who also jump on that bandwagon as well. And that's it. You have them in the conventional government as well, anyway, so that's it. But to answer your question, uh, some of them would have certainly been claiming to be anti treaty, but I suppose a lot of the anti treaty side would be disowning them as well. Especially the particular gang that were operating in this area um, in 1923. That's what so, but certainly lawlessness, there was a lot of. Private enterprise, to say the least. You know, it's very handy to women and women, way of applying it. But the cause probably didn't see that much. And it wasn't just here. Like, I, 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 I refer to one item there you have. Uh, a crossing, you know, the, the war along the border. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to Bernie Sweeney, and he told me he was in Baltimore that day, and they went down across the border. And he, he, they were caught, right. and he got eight years in, in, in Scotland, right. in, in Peterhead Forest. Yeah. And he said it was a hard place. He was released in 1926. That's right, yeah. He was. And, and uh, he had a little grocery shop in Baltimore. Right, right, yeah. And Bernie's training. That's right, yeah. Uh, Bernie was. Uh, I, if you want to read more about it, there, there was a good article to read by Jerry Brady in the Eastern Garden. 
a number of years ago, and it dealt with that. And it dealt with, with the, the crowd that went across the border at that time. Um, those guys actually, they would have been termed the forgotten prisoners. Sorry? They were termed the forgotten prisoners because yeah, they, were forgotten prisoners. They, were, they were forgotten in they were forgotten. ways. That why there was attempts uh, to get them out. They were in 1926. 26, yeah. 26. So it was four years, and that those four years were a very hard they four were, years. They were very hard. Yeah, because yeah. Joe Renner is one of the guys in guys that and his cousin I Brandon. Was, and and, 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 and Griffin Barr Cooper. Griffin Barr Cooper. Or Barr Cooper. That's right, yeah. Yes. And, uh, but it was, they did, like somebody says, they hard, you know, hard labour. They certainly did hard labour there. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It's not that so, that's it. Any other questions, Nancy? Any other questions, no. I'm getting away lightly tonight, I think, which is great. Yeah, oh, yeah absolutely, yeah. You referred to the, the British government and the Irish yeah. state. Yeah. The, the, the guns that they, um, well, uh, well, they basically, if you take the four courts for example, the guns that pounded the four courts were actually borrowed from the British army to pound the four courts because they actually had tried to do it, um, the initial um, ammunition for them, it didn't actually penetrate. They were actually trying it, believe it or not, before that and it didn't happen. But, the, but certainly those guns were, but they also went along and got arms and ammunition, other arms and ammunition as well, you know, because again, the, 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 the provisional government at the time didn't have funds, didn't, didn't have a lot of money, but they were supplied, because it was in the interest really, I suppose, of the British administration that, you know, that, that the pro-treaty side were going to win that war, so they armed them and that was it, you know. So, yeah, a lot of arms and ammunition came from Britain into the army, like into the into the provisional government, yeah. Especially the the, the sixteen pounder ones that that um, attacked that blew up the, the four courts and started up the civil war. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Could the whole thing have been divided? The civil war. Yeah I, I, I suppose like any road could have been avoided but but you've got to realise that, I suppose, when you look at some of the characters on the anti-treaty side... Well, if the members that went in to make the treaty or to establish the thing, if they hadn't agreed with the, with the petitions from the British... Mm. Well, what would have happened, um, God only knows, it's the what-ifs. But a lot of people would have said that, like, when Lloyd George was threatening you know, the, the might of the British Army. I think Collins knew in many respects that he probably, he was sincere in his threats. Because a lot of people would have argued that Collins, that the IRA, and there's a big debate on this, but most objective analysis would say that the IRA were beaten in, when the truce was signed in, in, in July, 1921. Uh, they were on. They were on their last legs, from an arms and ammunition point of view. And Henry Wilson, who was killed just before the Civil War, Roland Green, who carried wrote a very good book on it. Um, but Wilson was again. He was only from up the road here in Longford. Um, uh, he was a again. Obviously, the old landed aristocracy, unions, or whatever. But he was a commander and a former British Army commander. Um, but he was adamant that what they should have done at the time was they should have carried the fight all the time and wiped out the IRA. Now, the politicians, he hated politicians, he went along and basically um, felt that they made a big mistake by actually agreeing to a truce with the IRA. The only reason why they agreed to a truce was because there was massive international pressure on Britain at the time because of all the atrocities that was carried out. So everybody wanted peace and that was it. And, you know, a lot of people would have said really that, yeah, look, it was probably the best move, you know. And even in the truce period, the IRA used the truce period, and especially here, there's massive training camps across the in that period from... from um, 
July to when the treaty was signed to try to go along and actually build up a depleted force again. That's what they tried to do. But I think Collins probably knew that if if the British opened up on them again, they probably wouldn't have beaten them. They would have obviously conducted a guerrilla warfare and stuff like that. But Collins was of the view, I suppose in fairness to him, that look, we have 26 counties, would you like it or not? So we'd actually try to go along and eat away bit by bit at, at the others. Now, it, it all like, it depends on what perspective you have. But your, your question was, could it have been avoided? Um, there was an awful lot of people with very strong personalities on the anti-treaty side. And most of the IRA leaders, the likes of Cattle Brewer, Rory O'Connor, Liam Mellows, all those guys, very strong figures, Ernie O'Malley, were all anti-treaty. And there was nothing for them but the Republic, as far as they were concerned, 32 come ago. So could it have been avoided? I would have said, given the personalities, no, probably couldn't. Could Dev have broken on sighted? Could Dev have? Could, could Dev Valera have, with his influence, brought those hardliners on, on site and, and see that it's a step and it's only a step and we can, uh, we can work he, towards? He probably could have, but knowing some of the hardliners, an awful lot of you find that an awful lot of hardliners, you know, the, the soldiers, for want of a better word, yes. don't trust the politicians. You find that there was a lot of that. So you find that the Liam Lynches, who was Chief of Staff at the IRA until he was shot in the Knock Hill Down Mountains in April 1923, a lot of that crew were very... They didn't trust politicians. They didn't. Could Dev have done it? He probably might have. He was a very influential figure. He was a wily operator, as everybody knows. I don't know. But again, given uh, uh, answer this gentleman's question here, given the personalities that were on board, you know, Cahill Bro was a very, very strong personality. Rory O'Connor, all those guys that were very strong. Plus the likes of coming them on, like Markovitz and all of these, like coming them on were all anti treaty. All the women were very anti treaty. So you had a hell of a lot of people who were very, very anti treaty. But funny enough, the general population were pro treaty were very much pro treaty. The vast majority of the Irish people wanted peace. That was it. You know, that was it. Yep. Just, um, you know, the, the Civil War ended in 1922. Uh, would, after the, the Civil War, would there be much of a need for uh, still a kind of military presence within the nation? Like, would there still have been elements within the anti treaty IRA that was continued after? Those yeah. Kind of Good, good question. The one area where it was probably required was around Rochambeau and Narigna. That that area, like I think it was, who was it? Was it Kevin O'Higgins arrived into Rochambeau? Was it 24, 25? And he actually had to be rescued after they actually attacked. They attacked the stage. This is government minister, you know. And that was it. So certainly there was a lot of stuff operating still around the region. To call it maybe a heavy police, a heavy army presence, maybe not heavy, but certainly a little bit more than normal. Because again, people would say there was a lot of what we would call social banditry operating as well, you know, at the, at, at, at the time. But certainly I wouldn't say a heavy police presence. I'd say now, come 23, like things were, were finished and that was it at the end of the day. People put the arms away and off they went, you know, um, uh, but certainly there was remnants, I would say, of it, remnants, not a lot, but certainly, it's an interesting question because when you see what, what happened with him, it was the Higgins and Remnants. Uh, uh, another uh, uh, Say the social boundary lasts about a hundred years, <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, yeah, um, I suppose the physical presence probably 
went away and stuff like that. But there's still, you know, there's history of resistance quite a bit, you know, still around the place. Um, like if you read the likes of Karma Suluan's book and stuff like that and the stuff in the 20s, there's still a lot of stuff going on in the 20s. You know, there was. There's no doubt about that. And you see a lot of people would say that well, I was down in Glen Farn this night week and they were just, we were just talking about it and we were just saying really that in places like Glen Farn and on the border there, you know, why there was a lot of resistance, you know, anti-treaty, the whole anti-treaty side was that you find that they said it's a bit different in the south of the county because in the south of the county there was no physical partition. You know, like in Ahavas, Clune was still here and Fane was still here or whatever. But like when you're down in the south, your hinterland, if you're in somewhere like Kilty Clahar, just down there is in another jurisdiction. It's the north. And that's it. So that really hit home to an awful lot of people. And it's just an interesting point, like and we were just discussing it this night week in Glen Farm. You know, that your hinterland you know, your neighbours there across that field are in another jurisdiction. And that's why there was quite a bit of resistance and a lot of anti treaty resistance down there. And will there be a United Ireland? I don't know. In whose lifetime? Mine? Maybe not. Maybe my right. children's. I don't know. Or my grandchildren's. You wouldn't know. You don't. I, like, I suppose the way the population side is gone. But like the whole Catholic Protestant, you know that this thing there lately, there's more Protestant, there's more Catholics now than there, there ever was. And you say, oh, there will be. But that's assuming that the Catholics in the North can vote for you United Ireland. That does not necessarily, that might not necessarily be the case either, you know. No one knows. Budget. But it can be down to economics at the end of the day, probably. Budgets dictate. Budgets will dictate. Economics. Who knows? That's the million dollar question, Michael. <laughs> That's the million dollar question. Folks, thanks very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.